Welcome down the rabbit hole, friends. We're here tonight to talk about the end of Gypsy Rose's book. We're gonna get all the way through it, but first, we're gonna go into all the people who are turning on Gypsy Rose. They're saying that this is too much, too soon, and they don't wanna have any piece of it on social media. Gypsy Rose Blanchard is a bad person. I do not understand why this woman is being so universally praised now that she's gotten out of prison for orchestrating the murder of her mother. Um, and for those of you guys who don't know, uh, she was a victim of a really bad case of Munchausen syndrome by proxy where her mom would literally uh, fake her having illnesses to the point where she was physically debilitated up until her 20s, thinking that she was still a child, so acting like a child. And she met someone on Facebook and the two of them conspired to get rid of her mom and uh, Gypsy Rose Blanchard just got out um, a couple of days ago and the boyfriend that actually did the is locked up for life and I don't understand why people can't see through the fact that while yes uh, she was the victim of a terrible crime this is still a master manipulator this is still someone that conspired to kill a member of their own family and now she's being glorified for it and even worse made it rich by it yes Gypsy Rose Blanchard is a bad so this is just one of so many videos, thousands going up on TikTok, criticizing and being awfully negative about Gypsy. And people on Instagram are starting to turn as well. I've been kind of surprised about the whole thing, but then not, right? Because Gypsy has been out there like crazy. They've already put out a docu-series and Gypsy said they're gonna be on a reality show called Prison Wives. She's posting all over Instagram and making some choices that people just think are really risky. And there are some people who were very involved with her and her family during her prison stay who are speaking out about how unsafe they feel Gypsy is. Sure. Um, Not to mention co-conspirators. So, right. <laughs> Um, wow. So you did, so, so you guys did have them passing notes and forth, back and forth between each yes. other. And from what I remember, I believe he was the one that initiated that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this video is from a YouTube channel called the Good Wives Network. And it's run by Fancy Maselli. I've spoken about her a lot on my channel and she is a person who was very amashed, extremely amashed with Gypsy and her family during her time in prison. Um, but there was definitely, I mean, she was reciprocating. She was going right with it. Actually, Fancy had a big falling out with Gypsy and her stepmom, Christy Blanchard. Okay, so Fancy Maselli is all over TikTok, Facebook, and now YouTube talking about the interactions that she had with Gypsy and her family while Gypsy was in prison, right? And one of the things that she did after she had a major falling out with the family is she sought out talking to people about, like... <sighs> The fact that Gypsy was presenting as a very manipulative person. Allegedly, this was happening in jail and prison, okay? So she ended up interviewing one of the jailers from um, Gypsy's jail stay before she was sentenced. And that's what we're listening to here. Now, do you think, um, I mean, did you see like a, a still like a, a, a lovingness towards him? Or did you see maybe a shift in that or... Um, at first it seemed like she still kind of cared somewhat, um, but I definitely saw that shift in the end. First, this officer talks about how she watched Gypsy and her co-defendant, Nicholas Godijan, try to communicate with one another. Um, she talks about how they had a difficult time just making sure that they weren't able to pass notes and communicate back and forth. She does say that Nick is the one who originated the communications and that towards the end of her time in jail, Gypsy became disinterested in communicating with him further. But honestly, and I mean, I was used to seeing all sorts of people in the jail. I, she's one of the best manipulators I have ever seen. Okay, so here's when the jailer moves on to talking about Gypsy just in general and letting, and letting Fancy know, well, now letting all of us know that Gypsy was quite manipulative. Um, the moment, from the moment that she arrived at the jail, she was manipulating people around her. She was playing them um, in different ways. And clearly the jailer did not like her very much. Now, 
It's here that I want to say, when I listen to the entire interview, it's quite long, um, the jailer has more of a background with Gypsy. Gypsy reported her um, as being someone she knew outside of the jail, and that would mean the jailer could no longer work in the pod. And the jailer, you know, states that that wasn't true. It wasn't true. Gypsy just didn't like her very much. Um, and so that was like something that once again, the jailer is like, she's just being so manipulative, always trying to change things the way that she wants them to be. Um, and had a lot of really like interesting manipulative relationships with other people in the jail with her. Really tell us why you think that. That's very interesting to hear yeah. so soon. He was able to get other people just basically, and, and and I've noticed some of the inmates, they caught on to this. She could get some of them eaten out of the palm of her hand. Okay, so from what I've researched, I've come to realize that Fancy Maselli actually like went to bat at the parole hearing trying to get Gypsy Rose Blanchard kept in jail. She was very concerned about her getting out. She's spoken out extensively on her channel that she was afraid and she is afraid that Gypsy was going to participate in additional cons or crimes and that this is something she continues to want to speak out about. So of course, we need to be aware that of course Fancy is very interested in having this jailer speak out about how manipulative Gypsy was within the prison system, within the jail, okay? Now, it's here that I want to say, and you know, I am partial to like Gypsy. I feel really bad for her, for what she's been through. It is extremely common for people like Gypsy, for children like Gypsy who have gone through extreme trauma to have these kinds of behaviors. It's very common. You guys know that I've worked extensively in a child S offender unit. And regarding my experience there, these are the kinds of behaviors that pretty much all of the kids have. So even though Gypsy is an adult when she's first jailed, we all know that she was living a life where she was quite immature. She was not exposed to a lot outside of her mother's abusive environment. And I would expect, I think most psychiatrists, psychologists, they would expect this kind of behavior from someone like Gypsy. And others were like, I don't want anything to do with her. That girl's batshit crazy. Um, and you, as an officer, you just, you have a lot of time to sit there and observe people. Yeah. And yeah, I would see her target people. I would see her work them over if they had something that she wanted or if she thought that they could give her some sort of advancement. So check out the Good Wives Network for more of this interview. Um, I'll leave it linked below. But keep in mind that just like anyone else, Fancy Maselli is coming from a certain place of having a big fallout with this family who she became incredibly enmeshed with. Okay, so now the time has finally come to finish Gypsy Rose Blanchard's new ebook called Released conversations on the eve of freedom. Um, you can obtain this book easily by going to Amazon and uh, just one click to buy it and you can read it through an app that they link you to. Very easy. Let's get started. We're halfway through and we're just going to finish the rest of it here and now. Okay, next part of the book is another conversation between Melissa and Gypsy, the woman who's writing the book or helping her write the book. Um, they have like a recording of it from meeting at the prison. And it essentially starts with Gypsy letting Melissa know that she was born Catholic. She was actually baptized and she puts a picture of it here. Her mom actually told her she that she believed Gypsy would become a nun someday. Um, and it's here where Gypsy seems to indicate that her mom may have had schizophrenia. She writes, Growing up with a mom who had schizophrenia, who saw shapes and shadows and heard voices, I felt like my mom had a judgment of me. When she would be listening to the voices in her head, she told me, there are eight voices in my head and seven of them don't like you. I thought being as clean as possible would get her to accept me. Okay, so this is where she's talking about as they moved from town to town, she kept getting re-baptized. And she shares another very interesting photo here of her um, in a baptismal dress. 
Gypsy said they went to church a lot. Her mom even put her in vacation Bible school. That was like the one activity she got to do growing up. But year after year went by and they would move from church to church. She never stayed in one place for very long. And eventually, because of all the lies they were telling and all the cons that they were running, Gypsy just came to feel like she could never be clean enough, that God wasn't going to be able to save her. So the church kind of became a place that she, it was a place that she went to hoping for some kind of salvation and she never found it there. Okay, so she's clearly like leading the reader down a path of feeling bad for her because she says like, I prayed to God, please save me, please get me out of here. And it never happened. And it was really hard. And she says that when she finally got caught for her mother's murder and she entered jail, she once again went to, um, you know, the church there looking for some kind of salvation and didn't find it. And then she shares a picture of herself wearing a Wiccan pentagram medallion in prison. And she says that during that time she was exploring Wicca. I actually really love um, Wiccan culture, <laughs> but I just think it's kind of funny, the back and forth. And I do, I feel sense a lot of manipulation even in this chapter alone. Um, I do feel for Gypsy, of course. She's being moved all throughout the country. She can never stay in one place and no one is helping her. No one is coming to save her. So I think there's some truth to all of that and it is really hard what she went through. Okay, so she's hanging out in prison and eventually she has a new roommate move in. Her name is Amelia. And I actually know an awful lot about Amelia because a friend introduced me to Amelia's story. Amelia goes by Millie and she is someone who was housed with Gypsy for quite a long period of time who had been found guilty of a similar crime. You see, Millie's boyfriend had attempted to murder Millie's father. And allegedly, Millie's father was quite abusive. This is kind of a controversial thing that was happening within the prison with Gypsy, and it still is kind of controversial because this girl who was being housed with Gypsy had a much longer sentence and no possible chance of getting out. Whereas Gypsy was going to get out after only serving around eight years. In Millie's situation, she has always claimed that her boyfriend committed this act by himself. And after he attempted to hurt her father, Millie stayed in the house, called 911 and attempted to save him. So there are a lot of people questioning how Gypsy got out, but Millie is still in prison. It's an interesting story, and I'm planning to take you down that rabbit hole with me soon. But let's get back to the book. Amelia, or Millie, moves in with Gypsy and becomes her roommate. Millie practices Wicca and introduces Gypsy to it. But then Gypsy like very quickly lets us know that she left the Wiccan culture <laughs> as soon as she began because she started having bad dreams or nightmares and went back to attending a Christian church within the prison, and she feels that prayers really protect her now. She talks a lot. There's many, many pages of her talking to Melissa about how when she gets out of prison, she's going to rely on her faith. Her faith that she's newly discovered in prison is what is going to get her through when times get hard on the outside. Chapter four, on becoming a public figure. <laughs> I don't know. We'll get into it. We'll see what she has to say here. But I don't know if she's just saying a public figure because her her crime was so public or if this is kind of about how she wants to become an Instagram influencer <laughs> once she gets out of. So let's get through this chapter. Okay, at the beginning of this chapter, Gypsy writes something really interesting about her mom. She writes, My mother's very close friend from high school told me, Your mother always wanted to be famous. She dreamed of marrying an actor. She loved to follow rock bands. Gypsy compares her own life to being on a stage. She says that Dee Dee loved the limelight. She even prepared Gypsy with certain phrases to say like, my mother is my best friend. They would practice it at home and Dee Dee gave her a lot of those lines to recite over and over again. Gypsy says that before the act, which is a television drama based upon her life, Gypsy felt like just another prisoner 
working through her stay in prison. But after the act came out, she became very famous and started receiving a lot of emails, messages, all kinds of gifts and interest from people outside the prison. Gypsy complains that the act didn't even approach her to get information from her about her life and that she really feels like it can't even be accurate because they didn't get my side of the story. She was glad that they didn't have Hulu in prison so none of the other inmates could watch it. Inside prison, other inmates were running up and asking Gypsy for her autograph after the act came out. And we've already talked extensively about what happened with Rachel Garlic and all of the people who became really interested in just like talking to, writing to, having some kind of relationship with Gypsy. But some negative things happened as well. Allegedly, someone um, called the prison and told them that Gypsy had an escape plan, uh, that they had spoken to her and found out about it. And so she had to go to the hole for a period of time based upon that accusation until it was fully um, investigated. And they realized that she had no plan of escape. <laughs> I think she was liking it a little bit too much in there at that point in time. But she was also very close to the parole hearing. So she certainly wasn't going to be trying to damage her chances at getting out for real. She talks about how people call her the M word a lot. That's murderer. Okay. And she essentially argues that the knife wasn't in her hand. She didn't commit the act. Nicholas did. Um, it is a little bit hard to hear that. And I, I do feel a sense of Gypsy not taking full accountability there. It is true. It's true that Nicholas wielded the knife. It's true that Nicholas committed the physical murder. But I do get a sense of like Gypsy trying to push away any thought, like just pushing it away so she's not as close to the act as possible. She wants to get as far away from it. Uh, you know, I mean, we all feel a lot of sympathy for her already. But there are just some behaviors from her that make it difficult to not feel uncomfortable with maybe what she hasn't learned or the progress she hasn't made or how she hasn't matured. It makes you a little bit concerned about what's going to happen to her now that she's finally out. All right, now she's going to talk about her relationship with her first fiance, who is named Ken. Ken wrote to Gypsy after watching the first documentary, the HBO documentary called Mommy, Dead and Dearest, which I think was like a little bit more true to the story. And they became pen pals and they became very interested in one another. She says that Ken visited her for the first time and immediately kissed her and started making out with her. <laughs> Maybe not immediately, but 37 minutes in she says. And she says that he got kicked out of the visiting room because of the no touching rule. Now, this is interesting. According to Gypsy, she and Ken broke up because once the act came out and Gypsy became very famous, Ken no longer wanted to be involved with her. She states that he was a very private person and he didn't want the attention or the scrutiny. Okay, I find this interesting. Number one, maybe that could be a really good thing, like to have someone like that in your life who just wants you to get away from all of that. That could be good, right? Number two, I'm suspicious of why he didn't want the fame, the fortune, whatever. Like, is it possible that he has a record, that there's other stuff going on with him, and he just didn't want anyone digging in too deep to all of that? I mean, I understand that as well. He ended their relationship and she says that it was like a real sense of heartbreak for her. <laughs> and I think we're going to hear a little bit more about this towards the end of the book. Next, she talks about moving on to her current husband, Ryan. And she says by then she had learned a lot about life and she learned to establish boundaries and ensure that people, you know, weren't able to get too involved with her that aren't like the people that really matter, her family, her husband, her closest friend, she had more boundaries up with people um, who were just like writing to her, wanting to be fans. So she doesn't really talk about it here, but you know, she and Ryan, they get married. Okay. And then she says, just a little while after, like four months after they got married in October of 2022, she started to feel a lot of self doubt about the marriage. And she just wasn't feeling like she could really be Mrs. Anderson. She says, I freaked the fuck out. 
Poor Ryan. I picked fights with him and maybe on some level was pushing him away. Alone and tired of crying over the latest argument Ryan and I had, I thought I could share my fear and confusion with some trusted friends. Writing, hi friends, I just want to let you know I am thinking about going forward with an annulment. <laughs> okay, so she has only been with this guy for four months. They're already fighting like crazy over the phone. They don't have any bills to pay. They don't have kids or pets or people around them causing issues for them, but they, they're really struggling. Um, maybe they're struggling because they don't get to be together. I don't know. But she says that she wrote to her friend saying like, I'm thinking about going forward with an annulment. And she hoped that her friends would actually just tell her not to do that, like get her off the ledge. And the very next day, um, it was written in In Touch magazine that she was getting an annulment from Ryan. <laughs> so she's kind of letting us know that even in the prison, like her friends were just, they were selling the information that she gave them, okay? Um, and I guess that was very upsetting for her. And it was actually the next day that Ryan drove all the way up to Missouri from Louisiana to visit her and try to like work on their argument. They settled everything and she realized that he was the one that she could trust. Next, she talks about how she's doing the Lifetime docuseries and she knows that people are going to criticize her about it because she's been talking about how she wants to have a private life, but she's decided she doesn't care. That's essentially what she says. She feels like God is with her and her faith is going to get her through this and God is telling her to go forward with this docuseries. <laughs> so she's going to do it. She says she has a responsibility and she's no longer going to be a victim. She's going to be an advocate. So she's saying all the right things here. That's what this book is about to me. It's so short and it's basically trying to set up like, like me, <laughs> I'm a good person. Um, you know, I, I'm doing all these things for the right reasons and life has been hard, but I'm ready to like pick up and get out there and be the bright shining star that I was always meant to be. Um, I feel like 50%, yeah, like that's what I want for her. And 50%, like, uh, this sounds like a lot of boo shit. <laughs> you know, I mean, we shall see. Time will tell. I want the very, very best for her. But as I've gone down this rabbit hole, I've realized there's just a lot going on here. She writes, my public platform will be a podium on which my self-worth an identity will blossom, and I hope that others, especially helpless children, will benefit from the sweet smell of the bloom. <laughs> okay. My public platform will be a podium on which my self, self-worth, okay. So this is a lot, her self-worth and identity based upon her public platform. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, these are the things that everyone has been worried about and concerned about, and her absolute devotion to like what she's going to do publicly, like getting back out on that stage that her mother, Dee Dee Blanchard, put her on for the first 20 years of her life. It was a false reality. And it's almost like she's like, okay, getting back out there, put the face on, starting over, creating a new persona. Um, and that's not what is probably like healthy for her to do. But she was a horribly abused kid and I believe she deserves a chance at another life. So if she chooses not to get the therapy and not get the help and go out there and just be an actress on the stage again, I mean, what can anyone really do about that? That's, that's her choice. Um, and it is a choice that I'm not so surprised she's making. One interesting thing, like extremely interesting thing that goes on here is she gives us an idea of like what her schedule is in prison at this point. And a chunk of her day from 5 to 7 p.m. is her talking to Ryan. He tells her about his day and then he checks her social media accounts, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. This is while she's still in prison. Um, she doesn't have access to the internet. So he reads to her like things that are happening happening and then she tells him what she wants to post and he types it verbatim <laughs> then at 8 p.m she'll call him back and they go over it to make sure she still feels good about what she posted um and that's how they they live their lives <laughs> while she's in prison so he's kind of like her social media bitch <laughs> i guess after um some other people like rachel garlic sort of got pushed out of the way 
And I'm just really surprised that this is something she was doing while she was in prison. But I guess a lot of people are doing it. She's not the only one. She does talk about living in prison during COVID. It sounds like this was almost the lowest point in time for her. And I've heard this from other people who were in prison with Gypsy or had some relationship with her then that COVID was just really hard. They were limited in what they could do. Um, they were... I don't know if it was really like locked down, but they, they didn't have as many freedoms as they did before. And this was hard on them, obviously. And that's something that comes up here with Gypsy. She talks about how when she met Ryan, she realized that he has a lot of faith as well. And they've been able to pray together on the phone. And this has given her a lot of hope for the future with the two of them. I guess Ryan was also concerned about what Gypsy might think or feel once she actually gets out of prison because Gypsy writes that Ryan is sometimes like, what if you want to go drinking and bar hopping because you never did that before and you want to experience hooking up and stuff? And I'm like, that sounds terrible. Why would I ever want to hook up with strangers who don't know me or care about me? By the way, I've never had alcohol, so I don't know if I would want it. I would never cheat. I'm not a cheater. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry because I know, I know what's coming. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, yeah, this is hard. This is hard for me. This doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, it's a very, it's like someone, um, who has a lot of maturing to do, um, is saying and writing this. So I get it. I don't expect the utmost sense of, understanding herself at this point in time. I get that she's not 100% there. Maybe she'll prove me wrong and this will be the, a love to last a lifetime, but I'm kind of <laughs> iffy on that. But at the same time, I've said it over and over again and I really mean it. This girl deserves a chance. She deserves opportunities. I pray, I pray um, that they come to her and she is able to handle all of it. I know she's going to make mistakes. I know there's a lot of learning to do, but I I just pray and hope she doesn't crash and burn. There's a lot of positive things in this in this book. You know, a lot of her talking about like all the things she wants to accomplish. And um, I hope that she gets people around her who are going to help her accomplish it. I do think her dad and her stepmom and her um it's like half brother and sister. They do seem to love her and care about her. Um, but, you know, I think everyone's being influenced by the idea that there's money to be made, there's fame to be gotten, and I don't blame them. I don't blame them about that, but it is concerning. The whole thing is concerning. Whew. So, of course, I only um, did excerpts from the book. There's a lot more going on in Gypsy's book that I haven't, I have not shared all of it with you here. That would be impossible to do and it wouldn't be fair. So I still encourage you to purchase the book, to read it yourself, to have an idea of where Gypsy is coming from. And I know we'll like all be watching what's going to happen with this together. Um, lots of prayers and good thoughts for her. And thank you so much for joining me down this rabbit hole.